Hi, this is Jim Lobato. I'm president and founder of a company called The Performance Group. Our business is helping the leadership of growth-oriented companies realize their potential. We do this by working with their sales force and helping those individuals discover and develop their unique abilities and to align those abilities with their opportunities. That's why we're known as a sales force development company. On our program today is Tom Searcy, his book, Whale Hunting, How to Land Big Sales and Transform Your Company. Welcome to the program, Tom. Thanks so much, Jim. Glad to be here. Tom, I know that you get around a lot. I want to get into the book today. And at the same time, uh, I think our audience would like to know what you're seeing out in the marketplace as you go out and work with CEOs in terms of uh, what's on their minds, what they're concerned about, and uh, what's happening out there. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think a couple of things have really changed um, in the, inside of the last maybe year and a half. I mean, I know that's, that's kind of redundant. Everybody knows about the economy. But what I guess I'm talking about is the decision cycle in which companies are making the buying decision to go for big programs. Believe it or not, for those folks that are getting deals done, the sales cycle has shortened up. I think part of the reason why it's shortened up is those people who are going to do a deal are doing those deals quickly. And so, and otherwise, they're just completely saying, no, we're not interested. But the second thing is there's just been this cycle that people have gone through, Jim. When, when the economy first hit, um, really everybody just froze. They didn't buy anything. They didn't sell anything. They didn't fire anybody. They didn't do anything. They just tried to figure out what it's going to mean for their business. And then the second thing they did was they cut costs everywhere they could, including letting people go and pushing pressure down onto their vendors and that was showing up in all sorts of price squeezing. Well, most of the big buyers that are out there have done all of those things that they can do, and they still have to figure out ways to improve their bottom lines and give themselves some cash flow. So what we're seeing out there right now is a, I'm going to call it a, a pressure for precision in pricing, in alignment, in what people are selling to other companies right now. They want to get to exactly the right amount of buy, no more, no less. They'll weed out the value add. What we used to do is value add inside of uh, processes and pro uh, programs and products and services. They want to take that out. They want to get right down to what is the core thing I can buy and how can I buy it for uh, as close to the right amount of money as I can go ahead and spend. And so just a lot of precision. And the companies that are winning deals right now, they figured out ways to show that just-in-time inventory, as a, for, uh, for example. They can show that just-in-time inventory almost right down to the one-day cycle. And because they can, they can provide that precision in what they're selling, they're actually holding on to margin. So I think that we are seeing this adjustment in the marketplace where it's not just price pressure anymore. People are looking for some additional way to hold on to the value from their vendors but get some pricing precision. You know, it's interesting, Tom, that uh, uh, could that be perceived by the salespeople out there when they hear that to just cut out all your features and benefits and lower your price? Is it being heard that way by the sales force? You know, that's a good question, Jim. I think that there's a, a certain amount of, uh, of uh, a falseness, uh, you know, what I, I like to call false positives, right? where they hear something, that data, in the way that you're describing it, and yet they misread it. And what, what, what happens is that the people that can figure out how to get that precision, you don't necessarily have to lower their price, and they can still win. You, know, you find those people that just lower their price anymore, we're starting to find those people are still finishing second. The other guy comes in, he's just a little bit more money, but he has a better understanding of what the need of the customer is. And because he demonstrates that precision in his pricing and in his approach, he wins the business, even though he's a little bit more money than the lowest uh, than the lowest cost provider. So they're truly what I think I hear you saying is that the companies that they're out there buying, moving ahead of projects, they want to make sure that what they're buying is exactly exactly. <laughs> they always say they want exactly what they want, but you're saying now it's give me exactly what we exactly need. That's right. And I would also say that the language of the problem that our customers and our clients are coming to us with, you know, when we sell features or benefits or we talk about the things that we can do, we have to start aiming for a new language. These large accounts buy three things from us. They buy time, they buy 
by money and they buy risk management. Now, I don't care if you're selling uh, copiers or if you're selling some sort of outsourced accounting services or if you're selling heavy uh, equipment or machinery. These organizations that are making buying decisions right now are buying time, money, and risk. And when we go there and talk about ourselves, this is the product I sell, this is the service I sell, here's the features, and here's the benefits, we're forcing our customers to do the translation themselves into their internal language, which is really time, money, and risk. And we all know that things get lost in translation. So the companies that are more effective in selling right now are coming from the other side of the table. They're coming from the prospect's wallet and the prospect's language, and they are making that translation into time, money, and risk. And those are the folks that are getting these projects to move forward. Okay. Let's talk about your, your book for a second. The book, again, is Whale Hunting. How to Land Big Sales and Transform Your Company. Uh, and my, my first question uh, on this is, what's the genesis of the book? You were sitting around one day and said, hey, you know what? I think I got something good here, and let's put it down on paper. But I know it's not that easy. Uh, give me some background on what got you to the point of developing the whale hunting sales process. Well, I, uh, I had had the opportunity to be in the executive suite, either CEO or COO, of four very fast growth companies. And those four companies had all gone from less than $10 million to greater than $100 million in size. And, so, and all of them had done it in less than five years. And in each case, we did it with large account selling. We didn't, so because of that, I had, I had worked with my teams and we had developed this sales process. So that process, it wound up matching up with whale hunting, and by, clearly, by, I mean, uh, particularly by accident. I happened to be in a, a gallery in a museum, and I, I saw this fascinating story about how people hunted whales, and I did a lot of research because I wanted to write the great American novel, Jim. I, did, <laughs> I didn't want to write the great American business book. But I learned all this stuff about whale hunting, and at some point I started to do some consulting with companies and trying to teach them how to do large account selling. And these two ideas came together, the process, the operational process of producing large sales and uh, the new practices around how to land uh, the largest creature on the planet, which is a whale, bigger than any dinosaur that ever walked. I mean, the whales are 60 to 100,000 pounds as long as 90 feet. Uh, they are enormous. And yet uh, eight people in a boat, all right, with basically a stick and 500 feet of line are able to go ahead and land that. You know, there's a whole lot of things that make that possible. Process equipment and preparation and timing and roles and responsibilities. Well, that was just a perfect uh, fit for the idea of how to land large accounts and how to go ahead and land large whales. You talk about um, in, in your book the um, um, how companies really started pushing a different way of making buying decisions. And you were talking about in your book how some sales forces aren't in sync with that. And I think what you attributed to this to, this change in their buying process, was this just-in-time or JIT strategies that large companies started adopting. So tell our audience a little bit about that triggering event and the impact it's had as it relates to selling to them. Well, there's a variety of systems and processes that support this idea of just-in-time inventory. There's enterprise resource planning and there's supply chain management. All of these things that squeeze out waste in the, in the manufacturing and distribution processes, as you get finer and finer in your ability to do that, all sorts of things inside of a manufacturer distri uh, distribution company have to change and become interwoven and interlocked. And when that happens, all sorts of people are involved, and you just and you're not able to be cavalier. I mean, a guy used to be able to, or a, a woman used to be able to make a million dollar or ten million dollar purchase all on their own authority. But now, if you make that decision, you're inner, you're really affecting lots and lots of subsystems and discrete processes inside of an organization. And if you make that wrong decision without involving lots of other people, then you wind up with wasted inventory and full warehouses, and, and you start to erode the margin of your business. So these people don't make those $1 in $10 million decisions alone anymore. Instead, they start to go ahead and bring in 
all of these other discrete players to make certain that they're making the right choice and the right decision. Then there's the second side of it, which is everybody is scared, Jim. I mean, everyone's afraid that if they make a decision all by themselves, that they're going to be singled out and maybe removed. Their decision will be uh, made to go ahead and fire them. And so people try to go ahead and get a little bit of a, a group around them so that there's strength in numbers. Those two things have really started to increase the size of what we call the buyer's table, the, the number of people who get involved in the buying process. And because there's more people involved from the prospect side, you need to bring more subject matter experts to the table from your side, what we call the boat, to go ahead and help to land those pieces of business. So let's go back to the uh, what's going on inside uh, companies. Um, first of all, for a reference point, Again, the book is Whale Hunting, How to Land Big Sales and Transform Your Company. Give us your definition of big sales. When we look at sales that are whale sales, they are transformational. A couple of indicators. One is is that it's an account between 5 and 20 times the size of your average account. So those companies that have a $100,000 average account, these are half million to $2 million deals. Or it could be an account that represents more than 3 to 5% of your company's annual revenue. And finally, Jim, it could be a game changer. Sometimes when you land a key supplier or a key distributor or a key alliance partner, you have to go through all the same processes of landing those new partnerships and relationships that you would as if you were selling one brand new account that was just of a, a, a very significant size. When, uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, that. That gives us a reference point because I didn't want the audience to think that they had to go out and sell just a Fortune 1000 companies to in order to consider that to be a whale. That, that's a good reference point. Well, if I could interject, Jim, and that's really, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that out because, you know, there are companies that, you know, there are CEOs I deal with on a regular basis. I call them logo hunters. They like those great big names. And they say, let's go get, uh, you know, Microsoft, or let's go ahead and get uh, one of the other big companies that's out there. That may, that may, not, that may not be the best idea for, that, uh, for you to do that, because the fact of the matter is that they could be too big. They could be the, the wrong kind of alignment with your organization. That whale could drown you. So instead of hunting logos, your whale should be about your revenue and what fits in with your business. Okay. These companies... Uh, we'll come back to what you started on the trigger event of just in time. Um, this just this ju- just didn't happen. It, it must have unfolded over what period of time? Do you think? Well, the, the real idea started, and of course, sometimes right now that the idea that it started in uh, Detroit, as we stand here with General Motors and Chrysler and others going through all the, the drama that they're going through right now. People forget that actually our automotive industry has been a huge driver in overall manufacturing and distribution best practices. And so this started all the way back in the 70s, and obviously the, the Japanese have uh, uh, been pioneers in some places and otherwise fast followers in this idea of just-in-time inventory. But as it moved through all of uh, manufacturing distribution, um, the wave of uh, IT that supported enterprise resource planning, ERP, or supply chain management, or uh, any of the other, or CRM, Customer Relationship Management, all those three-letter acronym IT systems that, that come in and penetrate the business, they've added ref- more and more refinement uh, that's really forced companies to be very careful in the selection of their vendor partners and in the sophistication of how they make purchase decisions. Is that because they were getting real-time data? I think, you know, I think it is because they were getting real-time data, and I think it's because they were getting discrete kinds of data that uh, was making their ability to respond to their own market more sophisticated. So instead of saying, well, we're going to go ahead and release the same kind of heavy equipment, for instance, for the next three years, they're trying to make sure that they only build as much heavy equipment as the market needs, because of going back to your point of real-time. But if they need to make adjustments, they've got their manufacturing process put together in such a way that they can make that. Well, gosh, I can't buy three years of, of components if I'm going to be changing my models every year. So it tightens up, tightens up, tightens up all of those systems along the way and makes people uh, make buying decisions in a different way. Tom, how has 
the decision-making process as it's changed over the years affected our salespeople? Well, I'd point, to, I'd point to three specific things that used to be the case in the past that are not now. First of all, and let's go back to 20 years, and, and in some cases just 10 years, but the first one is the idea that you would find the single most important decision maker, develop a relationship with just that person, and try to exclude everyone else in the prospect business because all they could do is distract the decision maker from buying from you. Now, that was where, the way things were. 20 years ago, and you could still do a multi-million dollar deal with just a handshake and the contract with one person. That is nowhere near the case anymore. Even the most powerful people inside of organizations still bring in their teams as a part of the buying process, and that's a big change over the last 20 years. Second change is the world of RFPs, request for proposals or request for quotes. That process by which companies go out to the marketplace and ask a variety of vendors to uh, put forth their best ideas, their proposals, and their pricing on a particular set of product services and et cetera. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, those were only uh, processes were only followed for multi, multi, multi-million dollar deals, $10 million and above. But in the last three years, because of Sarbanes-Oxley, compliance requirements of boards of directors, and because of the influence of compliance and purchasing and procurement, the RFP requirement or those processes that look like RFPs are starting to come out um, on deals as small as a quarter million dollars in size or even down to $100,000 in size. You used to just say, look, if they're going to put out an RFP that I didn't write, I'm not going to participate. That used to be the old saw that most companies would say. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to be involved in deals bigger than hundred dollars to $250,000, you're going to have to learn how to get good at RFPs or purchasing and procurement uh, processes because they're becoming the way everybody does business. As a matter of fact, if I could plug a book, I've got a book that's going to come out in the next six weeks, and it's called The RFPs Suck. Um, and the subtitle to that is How to Win Big Sales with RFPs. And it's, we, we wrote this book specifically because there's such a high ratio of large deals that are going to require RFP or RFQ processes. The third thing that we're seeing in, in the way that these uh, things have changed in the last 20 years is that the requirement of the person bidding on the proposal to be complete in their answer or their solution, meaning that in the past, uh, someone would uh, say, we want you to do exactly the following things, and they'd put out you know, 10 requirements. And instead, what, what we're seeing right now is as uh, large companies are making large purchases, they're going out to, to vendors that they want to talk to, and they're saying, this is the general direction we're going in. This is the baseline goal that we're trying to accomplish. Now, instead of us telling you how to get there, we'd like you to tell us what are your best ideas on how you would take us there. Major shift in the way that creative thinking and application of the overall uh, approach to solving a business opportunity yeah. is now not only in the hands of the prospect, but now there's a lot of it forced down to you, so that you're responsible for creating that solution completely out of whole cloth. Well, and it's uh, so they're really looking for a, a partnership deal. You know, they are looking for a partnership deal, and and they want a partnership deal, and then after we get it all sorted out to the partnership, they still come back to price, Jim. It drives you crazy. Hmm. Okay, so you could go through all this partnering process and still not end up with the deal. You could still wind up not ending up with the deal. That's exactly right. Although we have several, uh, in the course of the first five months of this year, we talk to all of our clients and past clients and ask them how they're performing. And inside of the, the first five months of this year, they've landed $220 million in new business. Many of those um, opportunities were deals in which they, it was the lowest cost provider, but by the time they got to the end solution, they were still holding on to a great deal of their margin. So there's still margin out there to be had in those large deals, even if you're coming in on um, what looks to be a lower price than what you're used to. Part of that's because of scale, and part of that's because of shared risk with your prospect. And by shared risk, you mean what? That means that we're 
struggling and mutually invest in, in uh, supporting the equipment it's going to take to, to, uh, to execute this process, or that uh, on the back end, um, as far as the raw materials, the components, etc., there is a, a minimum guarantee purchase to support the overall contract. Uh, in the old day, you know, in the old days, you, you would get an order and it would say, okay, fine. It's a, you, you have an open, uh, you've been approved as a vendor and you have an open uh, ordering process, but you would only know that you're going to go ahead and sell that many components or however many pieces of widgets because someone cut a PO. And there was no minimum guarantee or there was only, uh, you know, the, the minimum guarantee was so low that you were carrying a lot of the risk. Right? You had to order all your raw materials, you had to put in your plant in order, you had to have the equipment ready. In these cases, both companies are coming to the table and saying, I have to, you know, you, Mr. Prospect, are going to have to give me a much, much higher minimum guarantee if you're going to get the price that you want. And those companies are coming and saying, okay, I'm willing to do that because I have to achieve a lower price. And that's when I look at that, I see a shared risk. Okay. Tom, if you want to transform your company, why should whale hunting be a strategic part of that transformation? For many of the companies that we've studied, and we've spent time with some economists who've taken a look at this um, across a lot of industries, we've taken a look at some very high-level execution uh, consultants, and we've come to a, a baseline appreciation that you can grow your business at double what your industry's average rate of growth is. And so. If your industry is growing at 5%, you can get to 10% growth year over year, kind of sustained for as long as three to five years if you just have good salespeople selling your average size accounts and just good marketing people out there marketing. But you can't get past that two times market rate of growth without some other stimulus. There's some kind of uh, economic in, uh, uh, glass ceiling inside of there. To bust through that two times market rate of growth, you have to go hunt whales. And when we go, when I go out and talk to CEOs around the country, and I ask them to tell me about their stories and their history, the years that they were able to break past that two times market rate of growth always had a whale landed in them. So that whale is what goes in, takes you up to three times, four times, five times, and it's a it's a way to create an explosive rate of growth rather than just a um, standard rate of growth. And I have to tell you, there's nothing wrong with two times market rate of growth. That's all right, but. I, but, Jim, 98.5% of all the companies in the United States are smaller than $25 million in size. Mm -hmm. Only 1.5% get bigger than $25 million in size. There's a lot of reasons for that, but one of them is, is that you've got to bust through that kind of glass ceiling, and hunting whales is a great way to do it. Well, isn't it um, the phenomenon would be if you land an account – larger than you're used to, using your definition of, um, what you said, two or five times your average, right? Five to, t five to 20 times, that's right. I'm sorry, five to 20 times larger. It's going to either you get really good real quick <laughs> yeah. at supporting that, or you get left behind pretty quick. So it almost, and usually the people that land it and recognize that, oh my gosh, this is a big deal, usually they do some scrambling around and they cover the bases, and, and uh, it's kind of like that uh, uh, duck phenomenon where the duck looks pretty calm on top of the water, but underneath the water it's paddling <laughs> like heck, right? That's right, Jim. So I mean, they, it, it, is it because that phenomenon that that forces you to just get better at almost everything in your company? You know, that's that transformational point that you're talking about there because uh, big accounts make you better. They re They typically require you to upgrade your technological sophistication. They look for better installed processes and systems to, to support them. And those relationships oftentimes will provide some coach coaching to you on how to become better and give you good examples of some things that you can do along the way that they've learned. And so we know big accounts transform your business. Also, there's companies out there that have decided to, for example, some quality standards, AES, QS, TS, ISO, those are some, um, some abbreviations for some various quality standards that are out in the marketplace. Smaller companies will adopt those standards to support large accounts, and in doing that, they take themselves up a notch in the marketplace and are then able to go and secure other large accounts. And so that, that kind of stair-step approach of improve, add more accounts, then improve again, add more accounts, is funded by landing those 
those large accounts who helps to make it better. And the, these accounts, these these whales that are out there, you draw reference in your book that um, maybe your average account, the accounts that you're selling day in and day out, the accounts that your sales force is focused on, the accounts that your marketing is attracting, um, you know, the, the, the same stuff you said in your book that basically keeps your company where it's at. Selling to those accounts, uh, this phrase gets batted around a lot, uh, which is going in and finding out what their pain is. But you build the case in the book that when you go after whales, it's not so much pain as much as their fear. W- what do you mean by that? Well, the, the pain that we seek, and it, it is a mix of the two, but you're right. Pain is what gets them to the point that they want to make a selection of or do something different than what they're doing right now. Maybe they want to outsource. Maybe they want to get rid of one of their vendors and replace that vendor with you. But what will allow them to choose you? And you're making the point right there. The choice will be based upon are you, uh, are you going to go ahead and take their fear off the table? Are they afraid of doing business with you because they think you're too small or you don't have the resources or you don't have the people? And to, there's really four kinds of fears that keep a whale from doing business with you. Let's just say that they get excited and they, they really think that you can take their pain away. And they're getting ready to go ahead and buy from you and your company a large contract. But then they think to themselves, oh, I don't know, you know, if we bring these guys on and, and they make a bunch of mistakes, I'm going to look bad. Or, oh, gosh, you know, they're a small company. They're, they probably aren't sophisticated enough to know my IT systems or how to integrate with the things that we do right now. Or what are our alliances going to say if we bring in this small account? Those four, uh, what we call whale fears, which is that you would cause conflict, you would create a sense of change, that you might cause a lot of mistakes, or that because you're under-resourced, they'd have to work harder, that the whale would have to work uh, harder. Those fears, even though they're interested in doing business with you because they think you can take the pain away, they're afraid of doing business with you because of those four issues. And so you have to come up with a way once you started to talk with them and they believe that you can take the pain away, you've got to calm those fears for all the people that you're working with inside of the whale that, no, we're sophisticated. There's not going to be a a dramatic amount of change. And, hey, we know how to work with big companies like yours, so we're not going to cause a lot of conflict. And, by the way, we've got good systems, people, technology, and experience that will avoid the mistakes. And, finally, you know what? We have lots of resources, or at least enough resources, so as your new partner, my company, Mr. Whale, will take on the work, and I'm not going to put a lot more work on your shoulders uh, than you would have if you worked with a much bigger company. And that's where that fear comes in. If you can take those four fears off the table, you're going to get the decision. You know, the real hard part, Jim, is that when we're smaller companies selling to bigger companies, lots of times we, we get all the way through the sales process, and it's us and another big guy going after this piece of business and the big guy wins. Even though they like us better, they think our solution is better, they get fearful. So if we take that fear off the table, we're going to win versus those big competitors that are trying to get that same piece of business. Yeah, but Tom, don't um, don't large companies just want to buy from large companies? Well, the interesting thing is, is as long as the issue is just about their fear, they do. But Here's why big companies love small companies or smaller companies. First of all, they know that they've got leverage on it, and that's important to them. They, they want to be uh, treated as if they are the most important client, and when they're working with us, they know they're very important. Secondly, they know smaller companies are more nimble, faster, more flexible. Third, they want to have access to the best and the brightest people inside of a company. I mean, I'll tell you, when a big company goes to work with a big company, they may get sold by the hitters. But later on, they're going to be served by people who are a lot farther down the food chain. But if that big company buys from the smaller company, they're going to get our very best people, including the president and CEO, working on their account every single day, and they know it. And besides that, I'm going to tell you, innovation uh, is baked in small batches. Most of these big companies know that if they want an innovative solution, if they want a different set of eyes and some creativity, it's better to work with a smaller organization to bring that to the table than to try and get it out of a much larger organization. So they love to work with smaller companies to get those great benefits I just talked about, access and leverage and nimbleness and speed, focus and innovation. 
as long as they feel like when they make that decision, it's going to be a safe decision. And that's why we have to go ahead and take the fear off the table. So should those companies who have those things that, that uh, being nimble and being innovative and being able to put their best resources forward, should they be telling the companies that? Should that be part of the value proposition they're bringing forward? Absolutely. You know, there's the, the balance of the equation looks like this, Jim. You go in with all those qualities we just talked about, your value proposition, what is great to be a smaller company, and et cetera. So that's the way you get in. It's the way you secure your champion inside of the big company who really wants to see you win. And you get them excited about that, and you take the pain you take the pain away, you show that you clearly understand the pain. And then the rest of that conversation to all the other people who are going to be involved from the whale side is about the fear, those four fears I told you about, and how to take those four fears off the table, how you convince the operations uh, people that it's a good decision to go with you, that you're not going to mess things up, that you're going to do good work, that you've got enough resources, and the IT people that you're going to be able to integrate with their systems, all those different conversations. Those aren't about your nimbleness and your flexibility and your innovation. Those are about why you're a safe choice as a new vendor partner. Tom, whale hunting is 90% process and 10% magic. That's what you state in the book. Tell us why those ratios are so important. Well, the interesting thing is, uh, and, and uh, I've, been, uh, I've been with salespeople and family of salespeople and sold myself. Salespeople have a fundamental belief in magic. I call magic that sense of charisma and luck and timing and chemistry and uh, chutzpah, those things that make salespeople salespeople and they're, they're effective and et cetera, and that's magic. And it's, magic is required in any sale, but when you're in a small to mid-sized um, sales, that ability to create that, that relationship because of the qualities I just said, that's probably 90% of the reason why you win the business. If you read sales books, and if you go ahead and watch sales tapes and etc., they talk about the need to sell yourself first. And this is all of these elements I'm talking about that are magic, and you still have to have some of them. But as you get to those much, much larger deals, those complex deals with more people and more steps in the process, you have to be able to map a process that is understandable, replicable, that involves other people, the subject matter experts in your company, in that sales process, to be able to take the fear off the table of those, those very, very large accounts. And that's why I said success is 90% process. That's that step-by-step approach to those large account sales. And that it's only 10% magic, which is still that need for companies and people to line up and like each other and have confidence in the individual people that are going to be doing the work. So is it safe to say that one of the reasons we either don't hunt whales or... We send our star salesperson to go knock down this whale and it doesn't work is the unwillingness to adopt a process, this belief that this magic you talk about will get us to where we need to be. You know, I, you're exactly right. I, I will tell you that uh, there's a, lots of times when we go out and talk to CEOs, they'll, they'll go through their operations and their IT and their client services and they'll be very specific about it and they'll put processes and technology and and dashboards and ways to go ahead and manage every part of their business. And then they come to sales and they say, let's go hire a rock star. Let's go get somebody with big Rolodex, somebody with a big reputation in the industry, as if they're going to be able to go ahead and, appro- uh, and approach sales by just finding that rock star salesperson. But again and again, most CEOs are disappointed. They spend extra money for that particular rock star. They bring them in, and then within a, in a year, that guy or that gal are gone. They weren't able to be successful. They weren't able to, to grow the business. And they're looking around, and what's, what's their next uh, step? They try and go find another rock star. Right. But that's not how large accounts buy. Large accounts buy because they feel an alignment across the entire company and how we're going to go ahead and do business together. And that's how you take the, that, again, going back to that same statement I've made before, take that fear off the table. So if it's not a rock star salesperson who does the whale hunting, and you talk about you know involving different players. Who actually executes on the whale hunting process? Well, the executive management team, really, in the small to mid-sized companies who are selling to the much larger companies, 
have to be involved in that sales process. You're still going to use that salesperson. In, in our language in the book, we refer to them as a harpooner. But uh, you're still going to use that harpooner to establish the, the first front inside of the whale. They're going to go ahead and, and they're going to uh, track the whale. They're going to talk about what we do. They're going to take the, they're going to talk about the pain and what our compelling advantage is. Quickly, we're going to bring in our very senior executive management operations people to talk to operations people and IT people to talk to IPC people and so on to be able to move that whale along because the whale doesn't want to talk to your lower level staff. They want to talk to your best and brightest. It's one of the key promises we make when we go to a a large account is these are the people that are going to be involved in in your business. So so as companies, you know, if they read your book, if they listen to this and they get the concept of what, you know, 5 to 10 to 20 times larger in your average account would be and it transforms their company and they say, yeah, you know, I think that sounds like a good idea. Well, getting past that good idea, what obstacles are they going to run into that it's going to be tough for them to get this launched. You know, it's interesting. I was at a, uh, started a new workout program where we meet every morning for 45 minutes, six days a week. It's a pretty rigorous workout program. Got an email from my coach the first week, and she said, you're probably pretty sore right now, but our workout program is kind of like a plane taking off. When it, when it takes off, there's a lot of turbulence, but once you get airborne, it'll be okay. So hang in there for your third week. <laughs> the pain will go away. <laughs> so I imagine there's a lot of turbulence in taking off and deciding to hunt whales. What's that turbulence look like? Well, I, you know, I, I, that's a, a, a challenging question. I think that it really does break down uh, for most of us into, again, probably just a couple areas. And the first is, uh, our people. Uh, our, our people are used to selling small and mid-sized deals, and they're used to selling in a particular way. They're used to selling one-on-one or two-on-one with maybe a technical support person. And so you have to have leadership inside the organization that's really directing uh, the salespeople who are now your harpooners and the other people uh, in your organization as to what their roles and responsibilities are according to the process. And we lay out how to develop that process in the book. But how do we follow that process? It's kind of like your workout, right? You know, you, you understand what uh, lifting weights looks like and running and all the rest of that stuff, and you can go to the gym. But the fact is, is that you signed up for this program because you've got a coach there who's really making certain that you do it as the way you're supposed to do it and as hard as you're supposed to do it. That discipline, you really need your coach to um, kind of apply to you. Well, the same thing is true in whale hunting. The leadership has to apply that discipline to the people. That's the first thing. Second thing, whale hunting takes longer period of time than small to mid-sized accounts. So you have to have the patience or the belief, just like your coach said uh, in your workout, hey, you're in your third week, you know, don't give up. This is the time to keep pushing forward. You have to have that same understanding of the time that's involved. The third thing is you're going to be working with new tools. Whales only believe what they see. So when you're taking the the fear off the table, they're going to want to see what is your process for quality control. And we want you to lay that process diagram out for us. We want to see your safety manual. We want to see a, a deeper demonstration of your technology. Whatever it is, the whales are going to put you through some paces in your sales process and ask to see things that you're not used to showing. So you're going to have to generate that information or um, help to go ahead and design it and clean it up. And that's going to take more time and energy and effort. So people, time, and your packaging of information, those are the three places where you're going to get challenged when you just start going out into the marketplace and hunting whales. Tom, as people embark on this journey to land large accounts, what do they need to know? One of the biggest ones is that less is more. You know, it's funny. I look at, uh, I look at CEOs and organizations that get excited about whale hunting, and they look out in their market, and they're like a one-eyed dog in a butcher shop. Everything looks good. They want to go after all the whales that are out there. But I'm going to tell you, from our background, 95% of the accounts that you could be hunting, you should not be hunting. You know, here's a statistic you might not know. Uh, for people who play Texas Hold'em, and you've probably seen it on TV or played yourself, 
the people who win the most in that poker game called Texas Hold'em play the least number of hands. They they fold 92.5 to 95.5% of the time. And they fold because uh, they know most of the hands are not going to, in the end, be winners. Well, the same thing is true about large count selling. You've got to be rigorous in knowing what, and that's why in our early chapters we talk to people about how to build a target filter that gives them a high level of confidence that they are talking to just those whales that have the greatest potential for success because whale hunting is expensive, Jim. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes the talent of your uh, senior executive people. You can't have them out there just talking to everybody. We have to have a way to filter out the marketplace and recognize that there's only about 5% of the marketplace we should hunt. We kind of talk about it in two ways, Jim. One of those is you have to avoid toxic clients. Those are those clients that wind up being bad clients once you've had them. They don't pay you correctly. They're, they're hard to work with. They don't live to the scope of the agreement. They're frustrating. Most companies have had a toxic client or, uh, in their past. And the second thing you have to avoid are black hole prospects. These are those prospects that keep asking for more information and more diagrams, more prototypes, more drawings, more, you know, redo the proposal five, six, seven times, and yet they never pull the trigger on the deal. You have to be careful when you're out there in the marketplace to avoid those toxic clients and black hole prospects. And that's why we really encourage people to recognize that when you're hunting whales, you're hunting less, not trying to hunt more. Yeah, it's because it's interesting. You you say in, in your book, one of the steps that the whale hunters, the actual whale hunters, do is to sew the mouth shut because if they don't, that whale's going to sink. So imagine hunting this whale for days on end, actually yeah. killing it in an eminent sink on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of us who've ever been out there selling have had that happen. To yeah, us, that right? happened. Well, yeah. in your in your in your book, they you. You say if you follow the process, you should close 50% of your whales. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. What's the one question that I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? Well, I think uh, one of those would probably be what are the characteristics of good whale hunting uh, cultures and companies? Okay. Let's go with that. So I think the characteristics of good whale hunting cultures is, first of all, they can collaborate. Their senior um, management team uh, is able to work together and trust each other because when you're hunting those large deals, you're going to be, you know, if you use the metaphor, you're going to be out on a boat in dangerous waters for four to six weeks together. Uh, this is not the place where we need to have, like, reality television and everybody's fighting with each other. We need to, we need to get out there and we need to be lined up together. So first of all, you've got to be able to collaborate and trust each other. Secondly, people have to understand that it's a team sport, and, and that means that everybody has a role or a responsibility, and no one person is trying to go ahead and do more than what he or she should be doing. Third thing is, is that you have to have someone heading it up, and we call that person the shaman, which is uh, the, the holy person of the Inuit uh, people on that, but for most companies, that's either going to be the CEO or if they have a senior vice president of sales and marketing who kind of heads up all the sales and marketing people, it's going to be that person. So that means that out on the hunt, regardless of what the org chart says, that person has to be able to direct the efforts of all of the other senior leaders in getting that deal done. And that comes back to the idea of roles and responsibilities. So those are some of the characteristics of really healthy uh, large account sales uh, organizations because they're, they're really able to be successful because they can move a little faster and they can move together in a team, and it is a team activity. So what, what's the future of whale hunting? What do you see on the horizon? Well, I think that uh, what we're going to see a lot more of in the future is uh, that these larger companies, as they start to break down into smaller entities, you know, we're seeing a lot of big, big companies are starting to, to um, they're attempting to become more nimble themselves. So they're, uh, they're breaking up into divisions and, and into areas, and they're trying to go ahead and, and become more entrepreneurial because these behemoth uh, companies are finding themselves not able to be nimble enough for the marketplace. As that occurs, I really think for small to mid-sized companies, there's going to be an increase in opportunity to get big contracts because there will be more, fundamentally, more buyers out in the marketplace, even though they may be coming underneath the same umbrella. So a, a major Fortune 500 company, if you start to look at it, there used to be, say, 10 uh, you know, ten 
business units inside of that. There will be 100 business units inside of that much, much larger uh, company, which now gives us the opportunity to enter in into 100 different locations instead of having to get stuck in just those 10. So that's the good news. Tom, where can the audience go if they want to learn more about you and the book Whale Hunting and the Whale Hunting Process? The, the best place to find our information, you can, uh, you can uh, go online and order our book through our website. It comes out to Amazon. It's at www.huntbigsales.com. H-U-N-T-B-I-G-S-A-L-E-S.com. Huntbigsales.com. There's a resource center there, and on my blog, I put a blog out twice a week, and you can follow me at Tom Searcy on Twitter um, and LinkedIn and all sorts of different There's lots and lots of resources, essays and podcasts, and we've just put together a lot of information to help people to be better at hunting big sales. If they go to www.huntbigsales.com, that resource, they, you register for the resource center, and all of the materials there are free. Great. Tom, thanks for being on the program. Jim, thanks so much for having me. This or other BizTalk podcast may be downloaded by visiting our website at www.biztalkradioshow.com or you can subscribe to BizTalk through iTunes. If you want to learn the strategies how to take your sales force to the next level, you can contact the Performance Group at 800-550-9509 or visit us on the web at www.pmgllc.net.